2 Peter is where we're at. Chapter 2, we're going to read verses 17 through 22 and dive in together. Peter writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after have if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its vomit, to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Let's pray together. Father, we bow again this morning as your people, asking for you to speak to us today. Lord, would you speak in ways that only you can speak by your Spirit? Lord, would our ears be attentive to your word today? May our hearts be open to receiving, to discerning, to looking into our lives, to examining our souls so that we might know where we stand before you. May we not be caught between two worlds. May we not be straddling a fence regarding your lordship of our life. May we be yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Throughout history, pastors um, have stepped into, um, stood behind pulpits like this, maybe some fancier, some larger, some perhaps higher, some wider, But they have stepped into moments like this, carrying with them God's word. They've stepped into this moment and they have laid before a people the word of God and they have from it read and prayed over it and they have preached a sermon from God's word. This book is the word of God. God has given it to us so that we might know him, know his purposes for our life, know his promises to know the way we can escape hell and come into a relationship with him. And we are to guard God's word. This is God's holy word. God has spoken. He's given it to us. So what we do here today is of utmost importance. We have come to put ourselves under the preaching of the Word of God. This Word is living and active, Hebrews 4.12 says. In 2 Timothy it says that it is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This Word is our, our weapon in the spiritual battle That is waged here on earth. It guards and grows us. It teaches and humbles us. It encourages and convicts us. It challenges and directs us. And Satan knows the power that exists in this word. Satan knows the power that this word contains. He knows the effects of this word on your life and on my life. He knows what happens when men and women put themselves in, under, around God's word and put it in their hearts and make their whole life about this. He knows. He knows that in this word contains the hope of eternal life, the escape from this world to the escape from hell. He knows 
all these things. And so throughout history, he has sought to distort God's word, to derail people who were close to God's word. He sought to distract and destroy. And in many instances, they have succeeded. He has succeeded. Even today, many of us know someone in our life who at some time maybe made a profession of faith in Jesus, but now they walk in disobedience in rejection of God's word, rejection of God's ways. Some may not say it with their lips, but they say it with their life. Oh yeah, I know Jesus. I had that moment. Oh yeah, but a life lived apart from his word is an indication that they don't really know Jesus. We know these people. They live around us. Why? Why do they live like this? Because they believe something else. They've believed someone else. They have been deceived. They have turned their back to a different way. And Peter, in today's text, tells us that deception is the way of false teachers. They deceive, he says. He really is going to tell us a couple of major things today. He shifts from talking about the character of false teachers and then steps into sort of the effects of false teachers. And he says that the way of false teachers is deception and the end of false teachers is destruction. Their way is deception and their end and the end of those who follow them is destruction. So here's what I want you to walk away with today. True knowledge of the gospel guards believers from the deception and destruction of false teachers. True knowledge of the gospel guards believers from the deception and destruction of false teachers. Two things today we're going to look at first, the way of false teachers is deception. And secondly, the end of false teachers is destruction. The way of false teachers is deception. Deception. We see this in verses 17 through 19. And I love Peter so much because his whole text, T, uh, Peter gets so gritty throughout all of, all of the second chapter, doesn't he? I mean, he calls them bold and willful and they're disobedient. He, he calls them um, beasts. I mean, it's all over the place in his descriptive language. And even today, he continues. The first thing he tells us under this idea that they are deceivers, he's going to tell us three things here in verses 17 through 19. He says that they seduce with empty teaching. They seduce with empty teaching. Look at verse 17 with me. He says, these are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. He uses two illustrations right off the bat. Now, the Middle East area was very dry. It was very hot, very humid. And so you can imagine, if you're in the Middle East, you long for water. You long for rain. You're thirsty at times because you're walking everywhere you go, and it's hot. And, and, and here he says their teaching is empty. It is a waterless spring. It holds out a hope for you. It, it looks like it might be uh, something that would Thirst would give you water, would give you thirst, would fill your soul, but in reality, it's waterless. And mist driven by a storm, notice the word, this is not working right, so we'll just skip that and focus on the text in front of you or on the screen. They, they are mist driven by a storm. Storms were, were really important, and, and storms bring rain, right? Storms bring rain. And so you could imagine them looking for rain, Staring at the clouds coming only to find mist. Nothing. Ah, I, was, I put all this hope in, in this rain cloud only to be given a little bit of mist. Their teaching sounds attractive but ultimately leaves us thirsty, he says. The second thing he says is that they entice with empty pleasure. They entice with empty pleasure Keep going with me. It says, for speaking loud boasts of folly. So folly means foolishness. Their, their talk is foolish, he says. Speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh. Those who are barely escaping 
from those who live in error. Notice that they entice with, the, with these sensual pl- passions of the flesh. So their, their voice is speaking foolishness and their lives are all about immorality. Their lives are marked by sexual immorality. A life of, of this immoral freedom of doing whatever they want to do. And notice that they, the words here are, are so district, uh, dis- descriptive. They entice with sensual passions of the flesh. They appeal to the flesh. What's his desire? What is it that's in her heart? What does she really want? Oh, she really wants to be someone besides this or that. Oh, I know what he really wants. He wants, I mean, humbly, he wants to climb the ladder and be really successful. I'll give him what he wants. They entice. Oh, I see the desires of lust in his flesh. I will make this website open to him. I will, here's an inroad into the desires of your flesh. If you just do this or do that, then you will get this. They appeal to the passions of our flesh. But the true teacher, remember, the true teacher appeals by his word. God appeals by his word. Peter has already told us in chapter 1, verse 19, that we have his word more fully confirmed. That his word is to be that which we are appealed to. That his word is to be that which we cling to and obey and, and not let our flesh take over living according to our ways or our desires, but according to God's word and God's ways. And, and who do they appeal to? They appeal to the weak. Now, I, this the question might come. You know, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error, does this mean that you could lose your salvation? I mean, he, he keeps talking about this temptation that they're after the weak. No, I think he's, th- there's this reality that we live with. When you think about Jesus' story on the parable of the sower, it's found in Matthew chapter 13. Let me just read it briefly to us and remind ourselves about seeds sown in the hearts of people. Matthew 13, verse 3, Jesus tells the parable. He says, And he told many of them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Of which the disciples say, well, we have ears, but we don't get it. And so Jesus comes back around in verse 18 and explains it. He says in verse 19, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for, the one who, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. What's important to hear here is that the one who produces fruit is the genuine believer. Now, how much fruit must a person produce? Well, it doesn't matter. A hundredfold, sixtyfold, twentyfold, twofold. If you're producing fruit, then you're a believer. God does the work in and through us as we walk according to his word. 
But there are some who believe early on and they're like, yeah, we love it. If you remember back when we talked about the On Mission Together series, I talked about those four people in the, in the Great Commission. There's the non-believer, there's the believer, there's the disciple, and there's the disciple maker. And we want to help people when they believe the gospel to move into growing in the faith because we want to do everything we can to get them rooted in the faith and grounded in the word so that we know they are genuine believers. And so here Peter's warning that the false teachers are preying on those who are around the churches, who are hearing the gospel, who are low-hanging fruit, who are hungry. And maybe that's some of you today who are lonely and you're addicted and you're a sinner and you're looking for a way out. Well, come to Jesus today and we will help you grow up into maturity. It's what we're called to do. And we're reminded that the false teachers and false teaching in general want to knock us out. What are the ways in which Satan entices our flesh? Well, with, here's a few things. Follow your heart. One of the biggest lies in our culture right now is follow your heart. No, Jesus says, the heart is deeply wicked above all. We don't follow our heart. Godly living brings prosperity. That is not true. Godly living does not promise prosperity. Do good to others and good will be done to you. Do bad to others and then bad will come unto you. True or false? False. It's not the way of the gospel. God will never give you more than you can handle. That also is false. God gives people what he wants to give them in order for us to have great trust in his abilities, not our own. If you have more faith and do more good things, then you can be right with God. It's not true. It's not about what we do, but what Christ has done for us. I deserve better than this. I want more than this. My life should be about me and my happiness. No, this is the gospel of self-happiness. It feels good, it must be right then. No, so many of the false teaching entices our emotions and entices the me-centered nature of the culture we live in. Even some of the modern worship songs that we love, if you just go on there and listen to how many of them have me and I in the center and not Christ and what Christ has done. Me, I, I want it my way. So much enticement on empty pleasure. We are easily enticed by our flesh. And the third thing he says is they deceive with empty promises. Notice verse 19. They promise freedom, he says. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person to that, he is enslaved they declare liberty but only deliver slavery they they promise liberty but they themselves are slaves of their own corruption how does this work we think about things like um things in our our culture around sexual things around marriage you just need to free yourself from the bonds of marriage so you could really live be liberated enjoy the pleasures of the flesh no, you just become a slave to your flesh. You just become a slave to immorality. Give up on marriage. The grass is greener on the other side. They don't really love you. Just divorce them. You'll be happier anyway. Only to walk around way to find yourself full of guilt and shame. I know there are people in this room who've committed all kinds of sin in the name of me, myself, and I, only to find themselves liberated from something but a slave to their own guilt. Promise liberty but only deliver slavery this is the way satan works he seeks to deceive he seeks to discredit god's word and discredit god's character and he goes all the way back to the garden did god really say this eve to which she begins to doubt god no we are to cling to god's holy word peter says their teaching may sound desirous their words may sound enticing their promises may sound freeing but don't be fooled he says they are liars whose end only ends in destruction and that leads us to number two the end of false teachers is destruction four quick things here first thing he says is they return to immorality notice the the nature of these people they return to immorality verse 20 for if after they have escaped 
the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Notice, these were people who once came into the church, they came into the church with a profession of faith, they came in saying, oh yeah, I believe Jesus, I believe what you said about you being with him on the mountain, I believe that he was the Savior, the Son of God, hey, I'll be baptized, sign me up. After hearing these things and saying they believed them, it says, for if after they escaped the defilement, saying they had believed these things by the knowledge, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. They return toward the, to the old ways. They go again and they pick up the mantle of their own sin. They step back into the same sin they were doing before, They are led away from God's holy word. They walk in disobedience. And now they've even said, oh yeah, I I know Jesus, but he's okay with this. I know Jesus, but he's okay with my life. Like he's gonna understand my situation. And they walk in disobedience all the while pushing off their conscience. He's okay with me. Peter warns This is how they are. The second thing he says is they reject the gospel. They outright reject the gospel. Verse 21. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. They they say that's not the way anymore. I don't want to walk God's ways. I don't, I mean, if this is what it means to be a Christian, then I don't want it. If I've got to do this or do that, if I've got to say this or say that, I don't, I don't really want it. And they reject the gospel. Third thing he tells us in verse 22 is that they reveal their true nature. They reveal their true nature. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. He, you know, when he talks about vomit and mire here, he is, does not mince words. He is saying their true nature is coming through. They were never really saved. Their profession wasn't genuine. They were after something else. A momentary, maybe, escape from something, a confession that they just needed to get off their conscience and and someone just said if you just say these words if you just pray this prayer if you'll just get in this water all will be fine and they're going yeah sure i'll do that if that's what it's going to take i'll i'll do that if that's what it's going to take to get me out of hell i'm in but ultimately in time fruit is not shown what shows through is their true nature and If I'm being honest, I'm afraid the Bible Belt has a lot of these people. I believe the Bible Belt, who stands on Jesus and whatever else, and they grew up with testimonies because mom and dad made them say some words, or someone led them to Jesus and they were dunked and they were affirmed because they went through VBS or they were an RA or a GA or a WANA, and they grew up in this sub-Christian culture where everything's fine and God just, you know, it's America, Jesus, and guns. You know, I can I, amen that. But at the same time, there are some who really put all three of those on the same level. Instead of going, it's Jesus, and if I've got to give up this, then I'm going to trust Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus, and if this goes away, then I'm going to trust Jesus. It's Jesus and only Jesus and only Jesus. They return to their own vomit. Do you see your sin as vomit? That sinful anger that comes out at your wife or your kids? That sexual deviancy and pornographic things that you're addicted to the alcoholism that you can't give up the greed in your soul for the next opportunity the more the drive for more money and success 
the constant fighting in your marriage because you won't lay down your own self for your spouse. There's a new kingdom ethic that comes from knowing Jesus and following God's word. And we are to live by that. Those who make a profession of faith, but after knowing the gospel, return to their old ways, reveal their true nature. All the more reason for us to cling to God's word and to live it out daily. Now, I'm not saying like if you sin, you're lost. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying we should all be growing up into Christ. So looking back over our last six months, we should see us slowly and steadily becoming more and more surrendered to Jesus, more and more fighting our sin. Some of us have been fighting the same old sin for as long as we can live, and today it's more near to our eyes than ever before, and that's a fruit of the Spirit, that you're looking and you're ready and you're watching and you're anxious, anxious about it because you know it's coming. We're walking in the spirit and the fourth thing he says is that these people remain without hope all of verses 20 through 22 remind us that those who follow the false teachers remain without hope there's no eternal hope for the one who after hearing the gospel give testimony of Jesus' work on the cross believes in his resurrection and then walks away from it all jesus cannot be your savior if he is not your lord can't be your savior if he's not your lord who who's lording over your life is Jesus your Lord? Or when you peel back the layers, are you your Lord? Who's got Lord over your money? Who's got Lord over your mouth? Who's got Lord over your marriage? Who's got Lord over your body? Does Jesus have Lord over your time? And the, when we stand before God, is he going to say, hey, I know you, you said you didn't have much time to read my word, but you sure didn't have a lot to watch the movies or to watch the sports, or to hang out on Facebook, or to hang out on Twitter, or to hang out on Instagram. You sure had plenty of time for those things. Amen. How about my word? Where was it at in your home? Where was that at in your life? Where was it at when you spoke to your son? He spent all that time talking about the Panthers. Where was my word in your life? Ultimately, following the way of false teachers leads to destruction. And I'm afraid many of us have been deceived by this beautiful Christian subculture we have here. Deceived and following Jesus that says everything's okay as long as you just go to church and do some good things. That's not what Jesus says. So how are we then to guard against false teaching? How are we to stand against deception? Let's remember our main point here. That true knowledge of the gospel guards believers from the deception and destruction of false teachers. This is our main point. How are we to guard here? Here is my answer. I'll get that in a second. My answer is that we can guard against false teaching by growing in the gospel and our knowledge of God's word. That we can guard against false teaching by growing in the gospel and our knowledge of God's word. See, true knowledge of God leads to faithful obedience to the word, not the world. It leads to faithful obedience to the word, not the world. Matthew 3, 8 through 10 says, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from those stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. We must be a people of the word, not the world. And secondly, the true knowledge of God leads to loyal surrender to the Savior, not to self. We must be a people of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Galatians 5, 1 says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We must be a people of the word and a people of the Savior. Be Jesus people and word-centered people. Being able to discern what is false from that which is true. Living in freedom means living with the gospel in view. The, to preach grace to ourselves daily. And let's be honest. In a world like ours, there is a lot of things that Satan has to offer us. But it's all a mirage. It's all waterless. It's all empty. It doesn't give true satisfaction or true pleasure it does not fulfill any 
promises. It only leaves us desolate, dry, and doomed. But there is one who can quench the thirst that we long for. There is one who does give us true satisfaction and the one who always keeps his promises and his name is Jesus. He is the one. The one who came to live the life we could not live, to die the death we deserve, to raise to life, to hold out to us forgiveness for all of our wrongdoing, to save us for eternity, to give us life and meaning and purpose and never to leave us lonely again. Only Jesus can satisfy the thirsty. Only Jesus can set the captive free. Only Jesus is the everlasting hope. He is the source of living water. He is the true freedom we long for. He is the promise keeper. It is Jesus. And he is better than anything else this world has to give us. So brothers and sisters, we must know God and his words that we might discern false teaching when it comes our way and guard those we care about. How? How? By storing God's word up in our heart. So the question for us today is, do you know Christ? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Is he yours? Have you been deceived? There are many who know the truth of God but don't know God, and that's a very scary place to be, isn't it? Very scary place to be, to have heard, even maybe confess the gospel, but to now walk in rebellion. You don't have to be there. You can turn back. You can have assurance of your salvation. Another scary place is to look back over your life and to see if there's any fruit there, only to find not much fruit, spiritual fruit. You can come to Jesus and have genuine spiritual fruit. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Christ Jesus is in you? So here's a couple questions for us today. Before we go, first, Are you believing things that are not true about the gospel or God's word? Is there anything in your life that you're believing that's not true about the gospel or God's word? Secondly, are you settling for your life before Christ or are you growing in your life with Christ? Personally, your own faith, set on an airplane on the way to Dallas on Thursday, my wife beside me and diagonally here is this older man, gray-headed, glasses. And he pulls out his phone and I couldn't help but like not see his phone. And uh, he opens the Bible app and it says on top, it says devotion. And on an airplane, Thursday afternoon, I see him right there for about five minutes, ten minutes, reading God's Word. I caught him in the airport afterwards, and I said, Hey, man, uh, you don't know me, but I just want you to know how encouraging it was for me to see you open your phone. I wasn't trying to be weird. But I saw the Word. Thank you for uh, doing your devotion. He's like, Man, it means a lot to me. Thanks so much for saying something. He told me a lot about that man. I don't know where he was going. I don't know who he was, but he knew whose he was. The time with the Lord. Third question, are you living a life consistent with the qualities of a believer? The way you're speaking, the way you're living, the way you're walking, the way you are in front of your employees, the way you are at home in front of your wife, the way you are when no one else is watching. Are you living a life consistent with the qualities of a believer? And finally, are you preaching the gospel to yourself regularly? This isn't a gospel of work harder, God won't love me if I fail. No, it's a, it's a the gospel that reminds us that it's not our own works, but it is the finished work of Christ on the cross for us. We confess to God, reminding ourselves of the grace He's had on us to forgive us. And we rest, and when we rest, we grow in the Spirit's work in us. So church family, I want us to respond today in ways that only the Lord can lead you to respond. Do you know Jesus today? Or are you walking in a way that is not consistent with what it means to be a believer.